I'm sure we all have heard about the excitement development in climate tech startups in the past few years. It's almost like every month we hear about a new fusion reactors, new fantastic sales in EVs, and new materials that's really going to help us in our fight against climate change. So if you're part of this movement, congratulations. It's never been a better time to get funding from both the public sector and the private sector in this space. In fact, $100 billion were invested in climate tech companies in 2021, and this is the largest ever growth in this period. Now, before you stand up, rush out that door, and start your own climate tech companies, I have a number for you. And that's 95%. This is the percentage of startups that fails within the first 18 months. Now, this number varies, depends on who the sources are and how you define failure is, and it might go up or down. But either way, it is still a huge number. And really make you pause before you take this leap of faith. And when we talk about startup failures, there are many reasons, but there's only one result, which is the run of money or investments before they're able to achieve profitability. And climate tech, is the one of the hardest class of startup to succeed because the capital and time required is significantly more than something that's less capital intensive. So, so the chances of failure for startups in the climate tech is significantly higher. And I happen to work in a VC that invests exclusively in early stage startups, and most of them are climate tech. And I'm really inspired by their aspiration and motivations and their perseverance, despite the uh, overwhelming odds against them. And I'd like to share with you for the rest of the talk that their successes, their failures, and really my inspirations on why I do what I do. But before that, I do want to rewind a bit uh, to a bit many years before, uh, 10 years to be exact. And before I was an investor, uh, I was that part of 95% statistics. I had an energy startup that ultimately failed, uh, as statistics says. I was making compressors at the time, and compressors are one of those devices that are really just omnipresent. They're kind of everywhere. They're powers the air conditioners in this room. They're cooling your drinks right now in the fridges, and they're in many factories. And they're also very inefficient. And so I made a compressor that's very efficient. And I thought it was going to change the world with this device, with this design, with this engineering marvel. And I focused everything on the engineering side and kind of ignored everything about the business, the sales price, go-to-market strategy, who my customers are, ignored everything, right? As you can imagine, I failed. And really for two reasons. Uh, I'm going to explore those two reasons in detail more. But the first reason is iteration. I did not make iteration outside of the engineering domain. I was way too focused on the techno aspect and ignored the business side. And second is preservation. I simply give up when I see signs of trouble. If I'm going to start over again, I will make sure that I identify the problems, the right problems to solve, and find the right solutions. And I want to make sure the market, the technology, the people are there to sustain the ecosystem. And there are many problems in climate tech that fall into that category. And they all need to be solved. And there are two areas that I am very personally committed to. The first one is finding process-oriented technologies that lowers our dependencies on petrochemicals, which really results in finding engineering, new supplements, to our current energy-intensive and pollution-intensive processes. A good example of that is the dyeing and color industries, where most of our coloring and dyes do come from petrochemicals, including the color on my shirt, on my, on my jacket. They are from petrochemicals. And ended up in the manufacturing of those chemicals, a lot of pollutions do end up in our environments. 
and I really love the solutions that startups come up with. We literally have startups running around right now in some of the harshest environment to look for biological replacements for those chemical, uh, chemicals supplements. And they are in the harsh environments because the samples that can survive the harsh environments have a higher chance of surviving our industrial process when we try to scale up. So they capture the samples, they duplicate them, sometimes in devices like bioreactors, and they finally replace the chemical dyes with their natural solutions. So hopefully next time you paint your house, I buy my next yellow jacket, I will have their biological replacements as chemical dyes. The next area I'm really excited about is automation and robotics, which really makes our, many of our necessary decarbonization activities more tenable, making really expensive, dirty, or dangerous job more accessible through automation. And a great example of that is the shipping industry. The shipping industry is one of the dirtiest and most polluting industry in the world. And a lot of inefficiencies are driven from just lack of maintenance. And an example of the lack of maintenance is how dirty those ships are, especially underwater, which is very difficult to see. And they have biofouling, those barnacles, and added on this adds to significant amount of additional drag and weight to those ships. Uh, by some accounts, that 80%, up to 80% extra drag because how dirty those ships are. And startups are solving that with robotics, right? So now we have robots roaming around on ships, scrubbing every single inch of the ships, so decrease the amount of biofoulings and barnacles on those ships. So coming back to the two points that I started my talk with, iteration and preservation. I believe those are the essential traits for success for early stage startups. And what they do is that they add to what I call marginal gains to success. They're not gonna magically increase your success chance from 5% to 50%. What they do is that they marginally add to the success chances. And small yet significant improvements can lead to monumental, monumental results. Why is that? Well, iterations help you build experiences. And when you're making innovative work, when you're making groundbreaking work, you learn from your failures and your experiences. And it's not just about iterating on technology, it's also iterating on your business models, iterating on, iterating on who your customers are, and who to hire as, the first, as first hires. So startup maturity is not defined by how long they've been in business. Startup maturity is defined by how many numbers of iterations they have. And second is perseverance. And as a startup, you will face enormous amount of challenges. And there will be times you simply want to give up. And it's really easy to say, hey, I'm done. I'm going to pack my bags and go home, right? So ones that with determination and perseverance will be the ones that continue through. And throughout my journey, I was working with many early stage startups, I have seen many great examples of both iteration and preservation, and I'm including some of my favorites here. The first one is be part of a team that pushes you forward. And it really takes a team to inspire and motivate each other. And for all the successful companies that you know, think back to the origins, to when they started. And you will often find a small team of founders share a common vision to really change the world through their efforts and aspirations. And this is exactly what we're looking for when we make the first investments to early stage startups. We want to make sure that they're committed, they're motivated, and they can pick themselves up when they fall. Technology can improve and business models can pivot, but the vision of the founding team to push each other forward despite the overwhelming odds, that's really hard to replace. And second is to pivot quickly with global challenges. And we do have a lot of global challenges right now. And startups are in a prime position to really make an impact because they're able to pivot, they're extremely nimble, and unlike large companies are often bogged down by the momentum. And a good example of that is a recent crisis, energy crisis in Europe, right, due to the conflicts in Ukraine. And 
Europe really needs to meet the energy demand, and as a result, they are keep looking for alternative energies. And the problem with the, the renewables is that the storage system is just really hard to come up with. The storage, the energy storage system, is just not up to, up to speed. And so, one of our startups who supplies the who has the largest deployments of vanadium reflow batteries in Germany, when they met with this, with this opportunity, they immediately pivoted. They went from the residential batteries and immediately to grid-scale batteries. And this pivot includes stuff like product, sales, deployments, etc. It only took months for startups. And where a large company might take years, might become irrelevant when the, when the, when the actual deployment happens. And this brings to our last opportunity, which is one that I'm most excited about, and that is to identify tangential challenges and opportunities. <clears throat> and a great example of that is the EV industry, which we already talked about a lot tonight, where the recent explosion of the electrical vehicles is just simply mind-blowing. It's just so many of those deployments, like almost every month on the streets here, we see new brands, new models, which we've never seen or even heard of before. And if you want to start a new EV company, you're going to have a hard time because how saturated the market is right now. But if you want to start something I call the picks and shovels of EV industries, you probably have a better time. You probably be more impactful because the ecosystem already built for you. And a great example of that is the cable industry, right? The cable industry, the cables in EVs runs for more than five kilometers in modern cars, and yet the way they're designed right now is still the same as 50 years ago. So there are companies right now making specialized cables, really just designed for the EV industries. And the cables in EVs are essentially blood vessels for the EVs. And the the cables in modern vehicles are just simply needs to be better. And some of the companies we have right now are essentially redesigning the cables, reinstalling the cables, and sometimes even just skip the cables and go together using laser sintering technologies. And the, the, the last example I want to bring out are the batteries, right? We're right now getting the first batch of mass-produced batteries back because they're end of life. And we need to figure out a way to dispose them. We don't want to put them in the landfills anymore. We're thinking about how do we reuse them, recycle them, or rejuvenate them. And all three topics, are, there are startups working on, working on those things. And this is a big problem when you solve before, really, we have significantly more batteries that need to be filled in landfills. So I am extremely grateful for the opportunities to work with the entrepreneurs. And their commitment and struggles consistently inspire me. So what does it mean for the rest of us who might not be running our own startups in climate tech? Well, there's many ways we can help them. If you're in the government, you can start initiatives that incentivize great startups. And if you're enterprise businesses, considering opening up pilot tests with them. And if you're in academia, open your research, open your lab to ensure your results. And if you're family, friends, or relatives, encourage them. Some encouragement might be all they need to push forward. Their conviction makes me hopeful in our fight against climate change, and it's an absolute privilege to be working with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm.